Hi, welcome to the Grim Tutors, your one-stop shop for all things Magic the Gathering. I'm Colton, also known as Pez. I'm Oblivion. So, what are we talking about today? Today we're talking about the glossary and slang. Wow! Wow. Enlighten me on what a glossary is. It's a list of vocabulary words, usually in the back of a book. Like a specific dictionary for whatever it is that you're reading. Real Webster hours. We've had so many conversations about vocabulary and keywords and abilities and all of these things. And this is kind of our wrap up to that of things that don't necessarily fit in those categories, but are still important to know like adventure. Adventure is a spell type, a subtype seen on instants and sorceries attached to a creature and artifact cards that was introduced into Throne of Eldering. So what does that mean? It's basically kind of like two cards in one card. We do like our, our, our BOGO deals. Brazen Borrower. It has Petty Theft, which is one in a blue return non-land permanent to its owner's hand, I think. And then it's on an adventure after you cast it for that side. But then you can cast it for its creature, which is three mana, three one flyer. When the creature's on an adventure, where is it? In the adventure zone. Oh, that's like its own spot. Yeah, you, they have like a little token that says on an adventure and oh, you put your funny. cards there. So you can't, they can't be like interacted with when it's in. When it's on an adventure, no. So let's say you cast it as a creature. Can you then cast the adventure? No. So you can only cast the adventure side before you cast it as a creature. Yes. Then we have additional cards cost. So additional cost is pretty much how it sounds. It's listed in the text of any spell that you would cast or is applied to a spell that you would cast because of another effect or rule that may be in place. And you have to pay that additional cost at the same time as you're casting the spell. Like Goblin Grenade says as an additional cost to cast this spell, sacrifice a goblin. So you would have to pay whatever mana goes into goblin grenade. One red mana. And also sacrifice a goblin. Same thing would be true for, say you wanted to cast your soul ring, but someone has a Thalia Guardian of Thraben out. Non-creature spells cost one more to cast, so when you cast your soul ring, you would have to pay two mana for said soul ring. Two mana to get two mana. Not as good of a deal. <laughs> Not very bogo. No, it's just buy two, get two. That's regular price, baby. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Shake them out. Then you have alternate casting cost or alternative cost, which is another way to play a spell besides its normal casting cost. Parts with an alternative casting cost were first introduced in alliances with the pitch spells being force of will. So in the example of force of will, it's... It's alternative casting cost. Instead of paying the mana for it, you can exile a blue card from your hand and take one damage, and you get to play the spell. That's its alternate casting cost. An anchor word is next on our list, and... It is essentially just a word that dictates a choice, but it doesn't really have anything to do with the spell. An example would be Master of Ceremonies from New Capenna, where this creature says, at the beginning of your upkeep, each opponent chooses money, friends, or secrets. And depending on what they have selected, if they choose money, you and that player each make a treasure. For everyone who chose friends, you and that player each make a 1-1 one, one green and white citizen creature token and for everyone that chose secrets you and that player each draw a card so it's not so much that they are words that change the spell they're not necessarily rules it's just by them choosing this this is what happens and that's actually what it says is that it just it precedes a choice gives it flavor but doesn't really it just like signifies the choice Next up is attach, which is found on like your equipment. It means to move an aura or equipment onto an object in the game or a player. If you already have an equipment out on the battlefield, you are equipping when you when you equip the equipment it's attaching it to the the creature and then if you are casting an aura when you cast it it will say enchant player creature okay. land and it says to attach it to that thing and since we're kind of already on the subject i guess we can mention auras i believe we've mentioned them before but so nice we'll say it twice they are enchantment types that either attach to a creature a player a land and you are enchanting 
that person or that permanent. They aren't just applicable to everything like a regular enchantment is. Next thing to go over is backup. Backup was introduced in March of the Machines. It reads, whenever the card with backup enters the battlefield, players may put any number of 1-1 counters on target creature equal to the number that is the backup. Another target creature is chosen. That creature also gains the abilities that are printed after the backup ability. Say you play something with backup one, but it also has death touch, and you back up one onto another creature, that creature will get a plus one, plus one counter and death touch. And I'm pretty sure that the counter, when you back up another creature, the counter is forever, but the effect, like the ability is only until end of turn. Right. But it does not have to be another creature. You can choose to back up itself. Right. Also in the one, one counter realm is bolster. A creature will have bolster and then a number. And it says that when you bolster, you choose a creature with the least toughness or tied with the least toughness among creatures you control and put that many plus one plus one counters on it. Now we're moving on to changeling. Changeling is is a fun thing as a creature. It means that the creature has all creature types at all times. So a changeling is a goblin, elf, merfolk, eldrazi, squirrel, oofy. Pick a creature. It is that. Wizard. It is all of them. Sphinx. It's everything. All at the same time. One that we have mentioned when we talked about Ascend is City's Blessing. So it's a designation that says if you have 10 or more permanents, you have the City's Blessing. And depending on whatever card it is, you get some sort of perk when you have the city's blessing. Now I have clash. Clash is a keyword action. Clash reads, each clashing player reveals the top card of their library, then puts that card on the top or bottom. A player wins if their card has a higher mana cost. So is it like they look at one and then it's like, I want to use this one? Right yeah, now. I want to use this one as my clash. And then when they clash, if you win, you get to usually put the spell with clash back into your hand. And so then what do you do if you put the card on the bottom of your library? You just reveal the next card on top. Say you revealed a, a mox opal off the top of your library. It's like, wow, that's a real bad clash card because it has zero mana. You put that on the bottom of your library and your next spell is a Emrakul the Aeon's Torn. That's a real good clash spell. That's yeah. 15, baby. Then we have Connive, which is an ability that we saw in New Capenna. There are lots of cards that let you connive and connive Knive is basically you draw a card and then you discard a card. If the card that you discarded is a non-land card, you can put a plus one plus one counter on the creature. Shout out Ledger Shredder. <laughs> Next we have Constructed. Most games of Magic the Gathering are played with Constructed decks made by players before they arrive to play the game. Then we have Convert, which is specifically used in the Transformer set, which is to take it from one side and flip it over. Wow. Next up on the list are Copy effects like clone, copy artifact, phantasmal image, stunt double, spark double. Basically a clone is you can have it enter the battlefield as a target creature or if it says target artifact it'll become an artifact or an enchantment. Basically whatever the card tells you that you can clone you can make a copy of it. If you can't make your own store bot is fine. Why play your own big creatures when you can just play your opponents? Then we have counters. We've talked a lot about counters. Counters can come in many styles, shapes, forms. Positive counters like plus one plus one. Negative like minus one minus one. Loyalty counters. There's so many different things but usually people will use dice to signify the number of counters that they have on a particular permanent. It is said that our wonderful creator Richard Garfield made counters to designate an increase in power or toughness to track the gaining of resources and to mark a permanent change. So the next up is Detain. Detain says until your next turn this creature cannot block, attack, or activate abilities. So devotion, devotion applies to your actual devotion to a color or colors. Your devotion is calculated based on the number of pips that you have on cards either in your library 
or on your battlefield. Grey Merchant of Asphodel. When it enters the battlefield, each player will lose life equal to your devotion to black. And Grey Merchant himself has two black pips. So you would count the black pips that you have on all of your permanents on your battlefield, and that would be the amount of life that would be lost to your opponents. And now we have a pretty easy one. It's just dice rolling. Dice rolling is a mechanic that has a random effect in gameplay. So there's some cards that it'll tell you to roll you'll like cast a spell and you'll roll a d20 and what happens is determined based on what you rolled what is it is it the book of many things or something cast a spell roll a d20 and then based on what your result is is what the spell does then we have dies and died this is a descriptive term that is referred to when a creature or planeswalker goes to the graveyard from the battlefield either because it blocked it died it was was destroyed somehow. Sacrificed. Any other effects, it has gone to see card Jesus. If a card's exiled, it doesn't die, right? Right. So if you have, like, Leyline of the Void, it never hits the graveyard. It goes into exile instead. Because of that, it never died. Because death in magic is based on it lived on the battlefield, it dies in the graveyard. If something, some sort of effect happens to where your creature does not hit the graveyard and it it instead goes to exile then you do not get die triggers the next is discard pretty simple enough cards like thought seize duress mind twist is whenever a spell or ability makes you discard a card when you have to discard a card where does the card come from and where does it go where does it come from cotton eye joe how do you discard how do you do it nope that's not the (laughs) that's not the rhythm (laughs) Where did it come from? Where did it go? Yeah, it is. I just couldn't. I was trying to be clever, and then I couldn't. So you're o- you can only discard from your hand. It goes to the graveyard. Now we have double-faced cards. So double-faced cards are I don't. There's no other way to explain it that they have two faces, right? They yeah. don't. They don't have a magic back. There's something on one side and something on another side. One side could be a land. And the other side could be a spell. Or one side could be an enchantment, and the other side could be that enchantment turns into a creature. It's just all kinds of crazy stuff. Or like that one Nyssa that's like a creature. Oh, and then it flips over into a planeswalker. Next up is dungeons. Dungeons are like planes. You can't interact with it. It's just there. Whenever you play a card that says, like, venture into the dungeon, you go deeper into the dungeon, and then once the dungeon is completed, it goes away. But then if it goes away, and you play another adventure into the dungeon card the dungeon comes back there's just a non-interactive thing that exists but has levels to it that do certain effects is there more than one dungeon i think there's five if you venture into the dungeon do you pick which dungeon you go into yeah you can pick which dungeon you go into and then if you completed a dungeon and then you got to go into a dungeon again could you pick a different one you could pick a different one or you could pick the same one then we have emblems emblems are a marker that denotes usually your alt on your planeswalker. If you subtract this many loyalty counters, you get an emblem that says something. But also the the ring. Oh, the ring tempts you as an emblem? It is now, that is considered an emblem, yeah. Next is enchant. Enchant is a keyword ability that restricts what an aura can attach itself to. So like enchant player, enchant land, enchant creature, enchant artifact, those kind of things. Then we have energy. This is the symbol that like looks like a shield with a lightning bolt in it. Energy is a a mechanic that gives you energy counters and you can use those to pay costs for things. Then we have enters the battlefields. We kind of talked about this in the in the the enter the battlefield triggers episode but enter the battlefield is referring to a permanent on the battlefield or an ability which is triggered when a permanent is put onto the battlefield is commonly referred to as an etb which is just 
the shorter term for Enter the Battlefield. Then we have Epic, which I have also never heard of. Like Epic Games? I don't think so. So it says, for the rest of the game, you can't cast spells. At the beginning of each of your upkeeps, copy this spell except for its Epic ability, and you may choose new targets for the copy. So one that I was able to find is Enduring Ideal. It's a sorcery that says, search your library for an enchantment card and put it into play, and then shuffle your library. But you, then it has the Epic where you can't cast spells for the rest of the game so every upkeep you get to cast that spell yes you every upkeep you get to search your library for an enchantment card and put it into play next is evasion they're kind of like static abilities except they tell you what it can and cannot be blocked by kind of thing like like shadow uh land land walk here if it, if your creature has island walk if your opponent controls an island that means your creature can't be blocked so shadow the creature can only block or be blocked by creatures by other shadow. creatures with shadow fear is it can only be blocked by black or artifact creatures so skulk is the creature if a creature has skulk it cannot be blocked by creatures with greater power then we have exert an exerted permanent won't untap during your next untap step. Next up on the list is Exile. It's another zone like the graveyard, except Exile can't really be interacted with. Once it's in Exile, it is basically gone forever. I think there's like one card that really lets you bring things back from Exile. I think it's like Pull from Eternity or something like that. Then we have Explore. This is kind of like an enter the battlefield effect where you would reveal the top card of your library if it's a land you put it in your hand and that was a rhyme otherwise you put a plus one plus one counter on the creature with explore and then you put the back the card back on top or put it in your graveyard so a creature with explore enters the battlefield you look at the top card of your library if it's a land you put it in your hand if it's not a land you put a plus one plus one counter on said creature with explore and can either put it back on top of your library or in your graveyard so the next the next couple couple on the list are ones that we've kind of talked about before which go along with the abilities morph and megamorph which is face up and face down so when you have a morph creature it is face down as a 2-2 two -two. but then you can pay its cost to turn it face up and now it is your normal creature again and there are some things that tell you you can go and get a card and it's face up or face down down so face up is just you can see its face and then face down would be that you would see the magic the gathering back then we have fate seal it's some sort of number when you fate seal you look at the top card of an opponent's library and then you can put that card on the bottom of their library so that's if you fate seal one but if you have like fate seal five you look at the top five cards and then you put any number of them on the bottom and the rest on top in any order next is fight fighting is referred to like I think ravenous bite is a fight card so basically you take your big old monster and you're like I would like to fight your you choose an opponent and you would like I would like to fight your one of your creatures and you choose a creature that your creature is going to fight with and they bonk each other hopefully your creature will live this exchange and their creature will die. They deal damage equal to their power to each other. We have already talked about this one, but it bears repeating. Flash is where you could cast a spell at any time that you could cast an instant. Flip cards. Flip cards are two cards in one. When something is triggered, the card is flipped and becomes the other part of the card. So meaning when, when the requirements are met for the card to flip over, then it'll flip over like day and night. Flipping a coin is just about as easy as it sounds there are some things that ask you to flip a coin and depending on the result you may receive a certain amount of benefits or if you win the coin flip you may receive a benefit one of the the most coin flippy cards you'll probably see is mana crypt that's true that's fair but what's funny is that it tells you to flip a coin and like no one Ni 90 percent of people roll a die <laughs> yeah. next up is goad goad reads until your next 
next turn, that creature attacks each combat if able and attacks a player other than you if able. So say you're playing a game of Commander and you goad the player to your left's creatures. Those creatures can attack you, but they have to attack and they have to attack your two other opponents. You'll often see on some cards that you get benefits or perks for historic spells or that you can cast historic spells for less mana. Historic spells are artifacts, things that are legendary, which can be creatures or artifacts or enchantments or sorcery, anything that says legendary in front of it. And sagas, the enchantment dash saga, those are all historics. And then we have horsemanship. Horsemanship was a really scarce ability that was in like Portal 3 Kingdoms, but it, is, it essentially boils down to if your creature has horsemanship, it can only be blocked by other creatures with horsemanship. Your guy's on a horse, nothing can touch it unless there's another guy on a horse. But that guy on a horse has to have horsemanship. It can't just be on a horse. Yeah, the picture doesn't count. It has to say horsemanship. You have to be specific about your horse riding-ness. This is an equestrians only yes. battle. Equestria girls living in an equestria world. The horse girls gonna love this. We have next imprinting. Imprinting is where you exile a card imprinted onto another card. So things like Chrome Mox says imprint when this card enters the battlefield, exile a card with it, and then you can use Chrome Mox to tap for the any of the colors that are on that imprinted card in its mana cost. So if you have something with five colors and you imprint your Chrome Mox with something with five colors, it can tap for all five colors. Next is Incubate and then Incubate N, which stands for number. So say you incubate three, you will create an incubator token with three one one counters on it and you can pay two to transform the artifact and it transforms into a Phyrexian artifact creature token equal to the counters that are on your incubated token. If you have three counters on it, it'll transform and you pay the two, it'll transform your creature into a three three. It's kind of like amassing, but instead of automatically getting your orc army, goblin, zombie, whatever army right now it's a it's an egg first and then you have to pay two so it can transform into, into a beautiful butterfly into a beautiful phyrexian artifact butterfly <laughs> Then we have the initiative. Another thing within a thing within a thing. This this onion's got layers. <laughs> initiative has to do with dungeons. So whenever you have the initiative, at the beginning of your upkeep, you venture into the undercity, which means that you advance to the next room in the dungeon. If you're not in a dungeon, you start a dungeon. And you can take the initiative even if you already have it. There are cards that say when something happens, like when this creature enters the battlefield, you take the initiative. So that's saying that you will go, you will either start a dungeon or you will go further into the dungeon when you take the initiative. And then when you have the initiative, you will go a step further into the dungeon at your upkeep and whenever else you would take the initiative. If I have the initiative and one or more creatures deals damage to me, then they take the initiative. So it's all dungeon crawly stuff. And now we have Intimidate. Intimidate is another evasion type but this time it says this creature can't be blocked except by artifact creatures or creatures that share the same color with it my red creature with intimidate cannot be blocked by your coiling oracle because that is a blue and green card investigating means to make a clue and we've talked about clues when we talked about types of things but a clue is a colorless artifact token where you can pay to and sacrifice the artifact token to draw a card next is keyword ability. It is a word or words that represent a piece of the rules text describing an ability present on the card. Many keywords are summarized in reminder text, especially in core sets. I believe that core sets aren't happening anymore, again, but they're a real friendly product to newer Magic players. So the reminder text is like the, it's usually in parentheses. It's parentheses and italics mm -hmm. tells you what it does. It can be referenced mechanically and effects could be 
based on the presence of keyword abilities or grant those abilities to a card. And then kind of similar are keyword actions, which are either a word with some reminder text or just the word that tells you that you are going to be able to do something if you have met a certain criteria. Collectively, keyword abilities and keyword actions are considered mechanics. Cards mechanic is what it can do. So something like metal crafting or metal is metal craft. Metal craft. You have to have three or more artifacts. If you have three or more artifacts, you have metal craft. And there are some things that say metal craft on it. So then you know there are some that remind you about the three or more artifacts. And then there's some that just say three or more artifacts and they don't say anything about metal craft. And it's definitely not confusing at all. Now we have keyword counter. It is a counter that gives a permanent thereon a keyword ability. You give your creature like a flying counter or a, a lifelink counter or like the card says choose one of these counters and it's like vigilance yeah, death so. touch lifelink fine next up we have learn which is something i'm going to be learning about you can reveal a lesson card you own from outside the game and put it into your hand or discard a card to draw a card have you ever seen this ever i mean yes i saw the cards but do any of them get Played? No. Next, we have Legendary. Legendary can be any permanent in the game of Magic the Gathering. With with Legendary comes great responsibility of not playing a legend that is the exact same name as your Legendary permanent that you already have. Let's say you have a Ren and Six on the battlefield, and you played another Ren and Six. You now have to choose to sacrifice one of your Ren and Sixes because there can only be one Ren and Six in existence at the same time on your battlefield. When it comes to legendary like instants and sorceries, you cannot cast them unless you control a legendary. a legendary permanent. Then we have level, which we talked about previously, but it is a way to put mana into a permanent that it gets some sort of benefit by leveling up. Next, we have life total. Life total is just what you're starting the game out at. Usually in, in a usual game of Magic the Gathering, like uh, you're playing some standard or modern legacy something of that sort your life total starts out at 20 but in commander your life total starts out at 40 what happens when your life total is zero you're dead you have lost the game it's over you lose good day sir so then we have we have loops and not fruit a loop is a a set of actions that can be repeated indefinitely whether that's during your turn you can create an infinite amount of mana an infinite amount of tokens an infinite amount of life an infinite amount of damage or an infinite number of spells to cast that would be a loop something happens here which makes another something happen and then you gain and it goes exactly once you've established that you have a loop you can usually shortcut it and say by doing x y and z i can explain what you can do explain your loop but while we say like infinite mana or infinite damage or things like that they can't actually run infinitely so the rules say if the loop is possible due to the repeated actions of a player the player must name an actual number of times they will continue the loop before stopping if the loop would be infinite due to mandatory actions the game ends in a draw if it would just loop and loop and loop and nothing happens like no one would win or lose then the game would just be a draw so that's why now you have to determine like i'm going to make seven million mana and do this with it. Then we have meld. Meld is an action that takes two cards and flips them over and puts them into one oversized card. You usually have to have both of the cards on your battlefield in order to do the meld. This was something that I know came back out in Brothers War, where if you had the Might Stone and the Weak Stone and one of the Urzas, you could meld them and flip them over and it became a big- Super Urza. Urza Planeswalker. And now we have menace. Menace means that my one creature with menace has to be blocked by two creatures. Normally, if there's a creature coming at you, you can just, one dude's coming at you, you can put one dude in front of it. But menace says, you have to put two. Then we have mill. Mill is to take cards from your library and put them into your graveyard. And now we have modal 
which is like modal spells like Colgan's Command or Cryptic Command. It's basically spells that let you choose different modes on the card. Colgan's Command, it has, you can return a permanent from your graveyard with converted mana cost two or less. You can destroy target artifact. You can deal two damage to target player. You can have a target player discard a card. So you just get to choose, and it says choose two of these, so you get to choose two of those m mode modes on the card. Then we have modified. So modified is a blanket term that refers to a creature that is either equipped with some sort of equipment. It, there's equipment attached to it. It is enchanted by an aura or it has a counter on them. So all of those things are considered modified. Monarch is next up. So Monarch is kind of like a, it's like a little thing that a player becomes. A player becomes the Monarch. So say I play a Palace Jailer. Palace Jailer says, uh, when it enters the battlefield, you can exile target creature underneath Palace Jailer. You become the Monarch. Monarch reads, at the beginning of your end step, you get to draw a card. But if you get dealt combat damage, you lose the monarch and that other player that dealt combat damage to you they become the monarch it's not always in the game but once you play a card that has monarch it is now in the game forever and cannot leave until that game ends it just keeps getting passed around kind of thing just like day and night just like the initiative those are all things that have the potential to happen in a game of magic once they start they don't stop like eating pringles but they don't happen unless something tells you that they happen. Then we have monocolored. Mono meaning one. Monocolored just means one color. And that could be referring to a card or a deck. Next up is a pretty important thing in Magic the Gathering, which is mulliganing. Say I drew my seven cards and I didn't like them. I thought I could do better. I will now take what is called a mulligan and I will put my hand back into my library. I will shuffle and I will draw a new hand of seven cards. If I like this hand, I will then choose to put one of the cards from my hand on the bottom of my library. For however many times you mulligan, that's how many times you put cards on the bottom of your library. So say I mulliganed four times, I now have to put four cards on the bottom of my library and I only get to start the game with three cards in my hand. We are going to do an episode specifically about mulligans, their rules, why you should do it. And that episode just might have a special guest. Then we have multicolored, which unlike monocolored, means more than one. The card has more than one color. Next up is the Oracle. The Oracle is a database of every single Magic the Gathering card that has ever been printed. So if you ever need to look up a card for its rules text or anything like that, the Oracle is there to provide you with that. It also really helps for like old cards that maybe they explained something way too much and weird. Yeah. There's just a text box and it's got little little millimeter words on it. Now we have outside the game. Something is outside of the game if it's not in any of your current zones. Whether that, so you've got, you know, library, graveyard, exile, battlefield. If it's not in any of those places, it's outside the game. So like your sideboard in formats that have sideboards, that is considered to be outside the game because it is not currently residing in the game, in the game, in any of those areas. Now we have a pretty lackluster uh, mechanic. Party is, your party has to consist of up to one of each, which is cleric, rogue, warrior, and wizard. And once you have each one of those things in your party, then if you have a card that gives you something for when you have a party, then that requirement is what met and you get that. For them to be in your party, they'd all have to be on the on the battlefield an oldie but a goodie meaning one we've already talked about and that's permanence a permanent is a card or a token that's on the battlefield pile is a temporary grouping of magic the gathering cards which is like fact or fiction your opponent separates the five cards from your fact or fiction into two piles you separate the two piles into two cards and three cards and then you get to choose one of the piles it's just a temporary, a temporary place temporary. and it's only only like in that situation like a, right. a pile doesn't just exist in the game unless something makes it exist in the game 
Then we have Populate. Populate says that you create a token that's a copy of a creature token you control. Next up we have Prevention Effect, meaning prevent combat damage or prevent from being the target of spells, like that kind of stuff. A prevention effect prevents you from being the target of whatever it is preventing. Then we have proliferate. So proliferate means that you can choose any number of permanents or players and give them each another kind of counter that's already there. My creatures have plus one plus one counters, my planeswalker has, a lo has loyalty counters, and my opponents have poison counters. If I choose to proliferate, I can add a loyalty counter to my planeswalker, a plus one plus one counter to my creatures, and poison counters to my opponents. Next up on the list is protect, which is primarily on the battles, battle sieges from uh, March of the Machines, and they're used to signify that the person is assigned to protect said battle. So then we have redirection effects. Redirection effects aren't prevention, they are redirection. It is instead of stopping what is happening, you are choosing to move it somewhere else. Next up we have regenerate. So it has it has a cost. So say it's one green. So you pay your one green and then the next time that this creature would die or be destroyed, instead just tap your creature which is turn it sideways. So you tap it, remove all the damage from it, and then take it out of combat. So a replacement effect is a type of effect that watches for something to happen and then replaces it with an entirely different effect using words like instead. Take for example, Dothy Voidwalker. Dothy Voidwalker says, if a card would be put in a graveyard, instead exile it with a void counter because then you can sacrifice the Dothy Voidwalker to cast any of the cards with a void counter without paying their mana costs. Then you have a card like Grolnok, the Omnivore, that says if a card would be put in your graveyard, meaning the controller of Grolnok, exile it with a croak counter if it's a permanent. So since Dothy Voidwalker says if a card would go to a graveyard, it goes underneath it with a void counter, it doesn't matter that Grolnok says that non-permanents go with a croak counter. So now we have a requirement. Requirement is an effect that forces one or more creatures to attack or block. So like Goblin Rabble Master, it makes tokens that say that is a requirement. This creature attacks each combat if able. And then we have reveal. So reveal is a keyword action that is clarifying that your opponents see the card. So like Worldly Tutor says that you search your library for a creature card, reveal it, and then put it on top of your library. So unlike a lot of situations where you're searching for a card, you're usually putting it into your hand or putting it on top of your library. When it says reveal, it is I am showing my opponents what I have retrieved or this card in my hand and then do whatever you need to. I know that there's like some lands that say this land enters tapped unless you reveal a basic land it's from a, your hand. Like Port Town. Port Town enters tapped unless you reveal an island or a plains. And now we have Sacrament. Sacrifice. Pretty cut and dry. It means to move a permanent that you control to its owner's graveyard. So say I play a fleshback marauder, everyone in my game has to sacrifice a creature. So you will choose a creature to sacrifice and then put that creature into your graveyard. Then we have scry. So scry means to look at the top card or cards of your library. If it was like scry three, you'd look at the top three cards. And then you can choose to either put them back on the top of your library or on the bottom of your library in any order. Search. Search is a keyword action that is like on cards like demonic tutor. They, they refer to tutors or search where the card specifically says on it, search your library for blank, put it in your hand, reveal it, put it on top of your library, whatever it says. If the card says search your library, then it is search. Now we have shield counters. Shield counters came out in New Capenna. They prevent damage. So if a creature enters the battlefield with a shield counter on it and it was dealt damage, you would remove the shield counter from it and then it would be normal. So it's kind of like an extra layer of protection 
truly an extra shield. Now we have shortcut. Shortcut is referring to like, say I have a combo, a loop. I can shortcut that loop by presenting it to my opponent. And instead of going through every single game action to speed up the game, I can shorten it by explaining to my opponent what is going on, my opponent understanding that, and then going through the shortcut of the loop. And sometimes it happens in like informal games too, where it's, oh, I'm going to to go and get this land out of my library. I'm going to get this land and I'll play it so I can tap it for this and then cast another card. So that way you can do your searching for that land when it's not your turn. Right. You play your Bloodstained Mire, say you're going to go get a Taiga to play your Birds of Paradise. You haven't actually went and got the Taiga yet, but that doesn't mean you're, you're not going to. You're just shortcutting it so your opponent can take your turn and not everyone has to sit there and wait for you to search through your library. Then we have shuffle, which it sounds silly to to bring it up, but the most important thing about shuffling is that the goal is to randomize your deck, right? But your library, your deck, can only be shuffled when you have been directed to do so. You shuffle before your game to get your starting hand, and then during your game, unless a card tells you to do so, you don't shuffle until the next game. And now we have sideboard. Each player in Magic the Gathering has a sideboard unless you're playing a format that designates that you do not have a sideboard like Commander. Your sideboard is composed of 15 cards that you get to choose which you think will help you win bad matchups. Your sideboard is cards that are outside the game. They're cards outside the game. They could go in your deck if you choose to. You can't access your sideboard until after the first game in a match and they're there to help you improve uh, your matchup. Right. They're they're there to help you. Obviously, the goal is winning, but they're there to help improve the situation based on what the, your opponent is playing. So if you need, oh man, my I need to go and get some of my card draw or removal, whatever it is that's in your sideboard that you think will help you play that person another two games. A skinned card is a card that is a Magic the Gathering card that is reprinted with another IP, another something. Like the Battle Bus. So whether it's like the Fortnite cards, the Post Malone cards, some of the Lord of the Rings reprints. We've talked about it before where you have like the name of the card and then in the bracket box down below, you have Glittering Caves of Algaron, Gemstone Caverns. It's still a Gemstone Caverns, but it was reprinted as Glittering Caves of Algaron for the flavor of the Lord of the Rings set. Snow next up on the list is a super type with no inherent functionality. Instead, it serves as an identifying characteristic of the card. So snow basic land, like if your basic land is a snow mountain, it is no different than a mountain unless you have cards that specifically want snow permanence. Because there's like snow art, there's like snow something, like creatures and instant. There's snow instant creatures, artifacts. If your card has a mana cost and it's a snowflake, it has to come from a snow land. It cannot come from a normal basic land because that normal basic land does not produce snow. But you can use your snow land to cast anything. So a snow-covered mountain is the same as a mountain unless you have snow cards in your deck in which the snow-covered mountain needs to be used for the snow cost but can also be used in just a regular red pit. It's also helpful in cards like Scred. Scred is one red mana. It's not a snow. It's one red mana, but it deals damage to target creature equal to the number of snow lands that you control. And some people play them like just because they're cool, I guess. Yeah, they are cool. Then we have source. So source in the context of magic can mean one of three things. The source of an ability, the source of damage, and the source of mana. The source of an ability comes from either the keywords of the creature or the keywords of the equipment or the enchantment, something like that. The source of damage can either be combat, they crash into each other, dealing damage through other spells, 
spells or source of mana can be a land or an artifact or a creature. Now we have split cards. Split cards is where it's it's two cards in one card, like fire and ice. You have two cards on one single magic card. There's also cards that are two different cards, but they have like a fuse cost. And if you pay the fuse cost, you get to cast both of the cards at the exact at the exact same time. Split cards can only be on instants and sorceries and not permanents. So now we have the stack. Quite frankly and honestly, the scariest thing about magic. It's also one of the coolest things about magic. Uh, look at me. I'm cool and also scary. Two things can be true at the same time. The stack is a zone, but it's kind of imaginary, where spells and abilities go where they wait to resolve because you can respond to different things happening on the stack before those things happen. So whether that's moving to different phases of your turn, activating an ability, Ability, casting a spell. Responding to an enter the battlefield effect. Everything that happens in the game goes to the stack, which is like a waiting zone if resolve. If your opponent is going to respond to it. It's almost kind of like, it's like a waiting line, you know, like a queue. Like, okay, here's all the things that are going to happen. They are now waiting in line because other people can impact or add things to the line. The stack for me as a player was the hardest thing to learn because it is the, in my opinion, the number one thing that gets talked about, but gets talked about with an assumption that you already understand what it is. I tried everything. I, I googled, I've tried to watch videos, I tried to read articles, but everything really came from a place of like, you kind of already know what it is and we're just going in depth. And it just right over my head. I would, I would watch gameplay videos and be so frustrated because I didn't understand how or why these all these things were happening could happen why are they happening at different times like it's it was just very confusing but luckily we are going to have a whole episode dedicated to the stack and we will also probably have a friend with us next up we have state-based actions state-based actions are game actions that happen when any set of improper conditions arise in a game it is the game's way of checking its itself before it wrecks itself. It's making sure that everything is valid. State-based actions will also be discussed in our stack episode. Talked about these before. Not not very in-depth. Won't be talking about them in-depth because they are stickers. Uh, stickers are counters that can be placed on permanents. They come from Infinity. They're just goofy, wacky little things that can happen in a game of Magic the Gathering. You have your stickers in your own sticker deck. It's just like some goofy nonsense to bring to your Eldrazi guacamole tightrope. Now we have stun counters. Stun counters came out in Dominaria United and they prevent tapped permanents from untapping. A substitute card or double-faced helper card is those cards that you use to substitute out double-faced cards. The substitute card will have a normal regular magic gathering back but when you play it it will be the double faced card it used to be back in the day they were on tokens and had like little check box for what creature you were you were doing delver of secrets uh, you checked a little box that it was a delver of secrets but when you when you played your substitute card you then got your delver of secrets out to represent that it was what it was. So that's those cards that are blank and just have like two text boxes gotcha. and then just like a blank part so you can write down what the card is. Then we have Summoning Sickness. Summoning Sickness refers to a creature that has just been cast during your turn and it is not able to tap either to attack or provide some sort of tapped ability. The only way to get around Summoning Sickness is for a creature or an effect that you have to provide the creature with haste. So surveil is when you look at the top card of your library, you can put it into your graveyard or back on top of your library. So there's cards with like surveil three. You look at the top three cards of your library, you can either choose to put them on top of your library or put them in your graveyard. 
So it's different than scrying, because scrying is either top or bottom. So right. Surveil is either top of library or graveyard. Right. Tap is a keyword action as the arrow. So when you tap a permanent, that is an action. You are turning it sideways, either to produce some sort of ability or produce mana, attack. There's lots of different things that happen when you tap it. Now we have target. Target is a recipient of a spell or an ability. Like say I'm casting lightning bolt. Lightning bolt deals three damage to any target. I can target a planeswalker. I can target a creature. I could target a player. Anything that could be dealt damage by my lightning bolt, I can target it. Or if I cast a disenchant, it says destroy target artifact or enchantment. I can target any artifact or enchantment. It's any target is anything and it will tell you what can be the target. Right. It'll tell you what can be the target of your spell if it can only be specific things. Now we are moving on to the ring tempts you, which is a new keyword ability that came out in Lord of the Rings. So the rules say as the ring tempts you, you get an emblem named the ring if you don't have one. Then your emblem gains its next ability and you choose a creature you control to become or remain your ring bearer. If you do not control any creatures, you still can be tempted by the ring. If something happens to your ring bearer, you have still been tempted. It's We talked about how the ring is also an emblem. So the same thing as with Planeswalker emblems, even if your ring bearer dies, the ring has still tempted you however many temptations it has <laughs> tempted you with. That's so, that's so weird. That's a weird sentence. The first thing that happens with the when the ring tempts you and you select your creature so your ring bearer is legendary and can't be blocked by creatures with greater power. That's like step one. Then if the ring were to tempt you again, then it moves to step two. So you still have the first thing and then it also gets the second thing, which is whenever it attacks, you can draw a card and discard a card. Whenever the ring tempts you again, you move to step three, still having items two and one. Whenever your ring bearer becomes blocked by a creature, that creature's controller sacrifices it at the end of combat. So even if it weren't going to die, it would be sacrificed. And then step four, you would get all of these things plus four, which is whenever your ring bearer deals combat damage to a player, each opponent loses three life. Every time the ring tempts you, it gives you an option to either keep the ring on the creature you have it on or put it on a different creature or put it on a creature, period, if you didn't have one. Once you have been tempted, you cannot lose temptations. Your temptedness was at two and your ring bearer dies and then you were tempted again, it would still move to three and it would still give you the option to put the ring on a creature. Now we have Threshold. Threshold is an ability that checks to see if you have seven or more cards in your graveyard. And if you do, you have met the Threshold requirement and you get to do whatever the Threshold ability is. Then we have Tickets, another Unfinity Chaos Carnival Extraordinaire Circus shenanigan. A ticket counter is kind of like an energy counter. It's denoted, it looks like a little ticket. Players get ticket counters and then they can use those tickets to do attractions getting my tickets at the carnival up next we have timing timing refers to the concept of when and in which order effects will happen like sorceries sorceries have timing restrictions because they can only be played on your turn during your main phases so now we have priority another thing that is challenging but also very cool about magic another thing that we will discuss when we have our episode specifically about priority and the stack. Priority is the right to cast a spell, activate an ability, or take a special action. You cannot do it when you do not have priority, and the player with priority can put as many things onto the stack as they want to, but before anything can resolve, all other players must pass priority without adding anything further. It sounds a lot harder than it is. Priority is magic's way of saying be nice on the playground and everyone has to take turns and you have to ask permission. You have to use your manners in Magic the Gathering. Transform. Transform means to flip a double-faced card over to its backside. 
or when it's on its backside, flip it back over to its front side. Untap is referring to when you take your card that is tapped and or turned sideways and you untap it. So that is also an important step in Magic the Gathering. It is actually the very first thing that you do in Magic the Gathering. When you look at a turn order list, you go untap, upkeep, draw. The very first thing you do in the game of Magic the Gathering is untap all of your things, which is once again, taking your cards from being sideways to being no longer sideways. We probably are going to have like a whole episode about taking a turn, right? Yeah, absolutely. Then we have venturing into the dungeon. Venture into the dungeon means go into the dungeon if you are not already in a dungeon. If you are already in a dungeon, you can proceed to the next room. Visit is a keyword ability on attractions that lets you visit the attraction. It's also where your tickets will be used. You use tickets to go to an attraction. You go to the attraction and it's like a carnival game and then you do the carnival game and then if you win, you get a prize. And that's the sticker. I think that it might be the sticker, but the stickers are also used for something else. Can we call Anna Margaret? Let's get her on the line. Ring a ding ding. Hello. Yes, Anna Margaret. How do you how do do you do? This is the Grim Tutors. We're very confused about stickers. Please help. Then we have voting. It is exactly how it sounds. What a shock. Some cards explain some cards instruct players to vote. And there are some cards that have secret voting or non-secret voting, depending on what the votes are, is what happens. Number one card with voting, Tivit. I'm a Tivit stan in this house. I don't care what Dylan and Cam say. Tivit's fucking cool. He's he's a pricey little bitch, but Tivit's cool. Like pricey and mana cost? Yeah, because he's three and Esper. A whole five. Plus one. When Tivit enters the battlefield or deals combat damage to a player, everybody votes, and then the controller of Tivit gets to vote twice. And it's either the controller of Tivit gets a clue or the controller of Tivit gets a treasure. And last and final on the list is X. X is a variable of however much mana you dump into it. Walking Ballista is double X, so I will have to pay. If I pay four mana into my double X card, which is two mana for each X, my walking ballista will be a 2-2. But X could also be like, pay X life, draw X cards. Right. It's just a variable. They say that math is for blockers, but there sure is a fuck ton of algebra in Magic the Gathering. Algebraic, as Finn the Human once said. It can also be referred to as dealing X amount of damage, gaining an X amount of life. Putting X amount of counters on something. X is in place of number. So we have officially completed the list of vocabulary that actually exists on cards in Magic the Gathering. But could you believe that we will also have a whole episode dedicated to all the other shit that people say? Because that is almost harder than this stuff because it's not written down anywhere. It's like learning a new language. It really, really is. Thanks for watching. If you'd like to support us, click the link in the description down below. Follow us on the social medias being Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, YouTube, you're already here probably in threads we also have a twitch for when we do streams consider supporting us on patreon patreon.com slash the grim tutors and you can find us on all of our socials at grim tutors mtg thanks for watching and supporting us it means a lot bless you a chew a chew we'll see you next time bye 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 <laughs>Hi, welcome to the Grim Tutors, your one-stop shop for all things Magic the Gathering. I'm Colton, also known as Pez. And I have cat hair in my chapstick. That's... that's hot. Look at all that! I wonder if it's so sneezy. Appreciate his glitter. God damn it. God damn it. Hello and welcome to the Grim Tutors, your one-stop shop for all things Magic the Gathering. I'm Colton, also known as Pez. <laughs> when the moon hits your eye like a big piece of pie, that's amore. Hello and welcome to the Grim Tutors. Oh, green beans have smacked my cock.